to the Son, into the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, at your divine baptism in the Jordan River, you revealed that you are consubstantial with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds and our hearts on this day of your great epiphany. Make us holy by the indwelling of your Spirit, and make us worthy to celebrate this feast of lights, so that we may glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the one Father whose voice came from heaven testifying to his beloved Son, and to the only begotten Son who is worshipped, whose light radiated upon the river, and who accepted the baptism from John, his forerunner, and to the Holy Spirit who descended and appeared above the head of the Son. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast, and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. The earth rejoices in your epiphany, O Son of God, and the peoples and nations shout for joy on this day of your baptism. You have dawned from the Father and have sanctified baptism for us. O Church of the nations, proclaim the glory of the Son of God, who became man and was baptized for your sake in the Jordan River. And we cry out to him, Blessed are you, O Christ, Word of God. You willingly emptied yourself and took the form of a man. You gave us a pledge of life in the waters of baptism, making us holy and heirs of your kingdom. Now, O Christ, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to sanctify us through this great epiphany. 
Create a new heart within us. Make us newborn children of your Father and pour out forgiveness upon your flock that we may worship you, glorify your Father, and give thanks to your Holy Spirit forever. Word of the Heavenly Father, you became man for our sake and were baptized in the Jordan River. You became the way and the door that leads us to the Father. Grant us your grace and mercy and accept the fragrance of our incense that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Kadishat aloho kadishat hayalatono kadishat lo mohyuto mishi khodeta med mehen yuhanon itraham alai Kadishat aloho kadishat hayalatono kadishat lo moho yuhuto mishiho detta med men yuhanon itraham alai Kadishat aloho Kadishat Hayalatono Kadishat Lo moho yuhuto She hold it amen Men yuhanon Itraham alai Holy and immortal Lord, sanctify our minds and purify our consciences, that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. Peoples and nations, waters have been truly blessed. All on earth be attentive, waters have been sanctified.
reading from the letter of St. Paul to Titus. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, for the grace of God has appeared, saving all and training us to reject godless ways and worldly desires, and to live temperately, justly, and devoutly in this age, as we await the blessed hope, the appearance of the glory of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to us to deliver us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people as his own, eager to do what is good. Say these things. Exhort and correct with all authority. Let no one look down on you. Remind them to be under the control of magistrates and authorities, to be obedient, to be open to every good enterprise. They are to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, exercising all graciousness, graciousness towards everyone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deluded, slaves to various desires and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful of ourselves and hating one another. But when the kindness and generous love of our God, our Savior, appeared, not because of any righteous deeds we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the bath of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in the hope of eternal life. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, <coughs> listeners. The Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, <coughs> Now the people were filled with expectation and all were asking in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, saying, I am baptizing you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. I am not worthy to loosen the straps of his sandals. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he shall burn with unquenchable fire. Exhorting them in many ways, he preached the good news to the people. Now Herod the Tetrarch, who had been censured by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the other evil deeds Herod had committed, added still one other, to these by also putting John into prison. After all the people had been baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the truth, peace be with you. For the grace of God our Savior has appeared to all men in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, we come to in the West what we call the 12th day of Christmas, the Epiphany. But as I reminded you before, Epiphany is actually the original feast day that commemorates the appearance of God in the world. It predates Christmas, as we know, on December 25th by about a century and dates from the 200s. It was picked up by the West, as we know, and what Christmas, because of the Roman circumstances celebrating on December 25th, wound up being adopted by the East a century later. So what originally was the Feast of the Epiphany, which just means manifestation, was the commemoration and the celebration of our Lord's appearance in time, which was his historical birth and his baptism, the manifestation, the theophany of the Holy Trinity at the Jordan. So when the East adopted Christmas, that became more on the birth, the way the Romans celebrated it. And then in the East, the epiphany for the Syriacs became exclusively his baptism which is why following the sermon, we will have the annual blessing of the holy waters um, and then the sprinkling. It's a reminder to us of our baptism and a renewal of, our, of us in that cleansing of our Lord. Now, when we look at this letter to Titus, it's a very small letter and we don't often have re readings from them in the liturgy. It's only three chapters. But this little letter is written at the end of St. Paul's life. He's probably about, it's about the year 65. So it's two or three years before his martyrdom in Rome. So St. Paul now has had three decades, 30 years of serious contemplation and understanding of what's going on with our Lord's apostolate, with the work of redemption and salvation. And this is what he's writing to Titus. Titus is the man that he left behind, ordained and left behind on the island of Crete to develop the church in that first generation. So it's filled with a lot of practical details. And if you listen to the epistle or if you read it in your bulletin, it seems to be a list of things you're supposed to be doing and the way you're supposed to be. And that's not false, it's actually what it is. But it's not just a list of what to do and not to do. As I've mentioned to you before, St. Paul always gives a doctrinal foundation when he gives us moral directives on things that we're supposed to do the way we're supposed to think. And it's the same here. 
And the reason why it's chosen by the church for reading in conjunction with our Lord's baptism is because it's actually, if you look at the epistle, is commemorating two epiphanies, two manifestations. One being our Lord's birth, his death, resurrection, his historical place and time. And that's the quotation that we began with. For the grace of God our Savior has appeared to all men. Now in the Greek, you can't tell in the English, but in the Greek the tense that is used is called aorist. We don't have it in English. It is one of the four ways to talk about something in the past in Greek. We do, we have different ways of speaking in English about the past. I ran, I was running, I did run, we have that. But we don't have a sense of a time with the aorist meaning. The aorist meaning is something that was done in the past and is now finished as a moment of whatever it is that was going on in the past. He uses this when he says that the grace of God our Savior has appeared to all men. This aortist tense is referring to our Lord's death and resurrection. It's referring to what he means by the people that he has acquired in verse 14. And as I've mentioned to you, we often have the terms in the anaphoras of your inheritance. It's an so the English word that they're using is referring to this segula of the Old Testament, that God acquired Israel of, by his people. So a people of acquisition, his inheritance, what he possessed. And that's what St. Paul is explaining. Because God appeared historically in time, this epiphany, in his death and resurrection, he acquired this people. But you'll notice there's a second epiphany which he refers to in this letter also. And that's the manifestation of our Lord in his full presence, parousia, which will end time with the day of judgment. So St. Paul is giving us, in a sense, two bookends in this letter. That God has appeared, he has established, and he has acquired for himself a people. But that we ourselves are turned and oriented in hope towards the day when our Lord will appear in full glory. And that's the context that he gives this list. The list I don't really need to explain to you, it's all pretty straightforward. But as we've mentioned before, it's one of those texts that you meditate on rather than just simply read. You go through to be peaceable, not to be quarrelsome. These aspects of St. Paul's, what he's giving then is that the action of the people who belong to this inheritance between the death and resurrection of our Lord, the grace of God our Savior, and the parousia when we wait for the full epiphany, that's simply the term in the Greek, the epiphany of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, between these two moments of time, <clears throat> you have the redemptive work, the liberating work of the people of acquisition of the church. This brings us back to that aspect when I've mentioned to you that the gospel spreads person to person. We don't become Christian because we read a good book. That may strike our interest, but we become a Christian because we meet someone who is living the gospel. And through them, that grace from our God and Savior is passed. And so what St. Paul is saying is that our actions of the people who are baptized, that our action is oriented as an action and as works, as deeds of honor, which are oriented to, toward the day of glory of our Lord's definitive parousia, his appearance. And therefore they are also actions of hope. Hope and honor is the foundational aspects of Christian morality. Not a series of rules we have to follow, but that because of what we have received of God's mercy, that elevates our actions by being the people of God, and therefore we must live to the level of that nobility. But that these actions are not just actions done now, but are oriented towards the day of judgment, and therefore they're in hope. Why are we to be peaceable? 
as an action of honor and of hope towards the day of judgment. Not the day of judgment that I'm waiting to be chastised and thrown into the bowels of hell. That's not the vision of the day of judgment for St. Paul. It's one of hope. And yes, we have grave and profound obligations to accomplish, but they are both things of nobility, of a people of acquisition, and of hope oriented towards his full appearance. And therefore, when you look through these lists, it makes much more sense. Why the very first thing that St. Paul is listing is to deny, our, deny impiety and worldly desires. We live in this age, but we are not meant to be of this age. As our Lord said in his Passion, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. It's clearly in this world, but it's not of this world. It's not from this world. And we have to begin by reworking the way we think. Epiphany being a great example. Even in our Eastern tradition, so many of our people have lost this vision that this is the pinnacle of the celebration of the honor of God. Many have already yanked down all their Christmas decorations and the house is bared. And this is shame. Because this is the great day that we work to. December 25th is not the pinnacle for an orgy of paper and cardboard, but is meant to be the beginning of a profound celebration towards the full epiphany of the Trinity at the Jordan, in which, as you saw in the hymn, is cast on fire, the fire that burns in the Jordan in our Lord's baptism. This is the reason why, and this morning we were talking before Mass, I didn't see the news, but apparently bombs went off in Egypt once again. And so people have been killed, people have been wounded, because of course the Muslims know what the Christians do and they know this is one of the biggest days of the year. If you look around you in our church, it's not the biggest day of the year because we have lost the sense of what epiphany is. Sadly, we've also lost the sense of what our morality and our virtue is meant to be also in honor and in hope. If we had that vision of beauty, it would be so much easier for us to be that virtuous imitation of Christ that we are meant to be. We're only on this earth for a little bit of time. And in 2085, none of us are gonna be in this pew. None of us will be here. We have a moment to be a chain, to be a link in that passage of the grace of God our Savior, and therefore requires the reworking of our thinking, denying impiety, denying the worldly desires so that we can live, as he says, in self-control, masters of ourselves, masters of our lives, disciplined. Not disciplined in the sense of being in pain and structured and all that, but disciplined because we are desirous to learn, which is what the word discipline means. And then he goes on to the positive aspect, to live then justly, piously in this age, in this generation of time that is given to us. And then in the lines that follow after, at the beginning of chapter three, he's reminding us that religion is not just simply a personal question. Within our modern context within America, we are trained to think of religion as only being purely personal. That is not the gospel. The gospel is our lives entirely, which means my life personally, individually my life within my family, with the members of my household, with my colleagues, with those with whom I live in my city. That whole aspect that spreads out is the reason why the Western world was transformed. If we had had this kind of anemic idea of the 21st century and the 20th century, that religion is just a personal opinion, shh, don't talk about it, impolite company. If, we, really, if we, had ha we wouldn't have the saints and the martyrs and the teachers and all the people that have come before us who created the world of which at least we were able to be born into a residual trace that remained. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, I don't know what the world they're going to be born into. But it will probably not have that trace and it will certainly not have that trace if we ourselves in this age, this time, show a full integrity of this faith. 
And that's why St. Paul gives in those next lines, teach them in Crete to be obedient, to listen, and to be always ready to do good, to be subject to authority. They are meant to be upright citizens. They are meant to be lawful people. And to be always obedient, not just to be obeying the law, but to be ready to do every good deed that comes to a possibility that they can accomplish. And to speak no evil, to be gentle. Ha, we can spend our entire life, decades, working on being gentle. To receive people and to express gently. And that's why immediately he says, not bickering, not quarrelsome. So you meditate on these. So he finishes by saying, to show mildness to all. It's quite lovely and very hard to do. Very easy to read, very easy to understand grammatically, but to put into practice. And that's why I leave you with two words out of this text, and I'm sorry to give you these Greek words. Krestotos, krestotes, is this merciful tenderness. So when it talks about the compassion of God appearing among us, this is the word he uses, the goodness of God. But krestotes has the idea of a merciful tenderness has appeared among us in that death and resurrection. And he uses this other time, the other word which you actually will recognize, translated in English by the word kindness, but philanthropia. Now our word philanthropy means you build a library. But the word technically is the love of humanity, the love of human beings, the benevolence in the Greek sense in the classical world, it's benevolence towards those who we can say inferiors, but the people who are in greater need. That's philanthropia to be able to show. It's translated as kindness, but its real meaning is there. And so that when we look at what St. Paul finishes and why I said this context of morality, is because he uses the word palingenesia, which is translated in the epistle, I think, today as like a regeneration. And it has the sense of this renewal but which is in the baptism of that cleansing with water and the spirit that we have. That's linking our epiphany with our baptisms. Why do we live in this way of honor and of hope? Because we have been made new again. And he uses that word expressly, anakinosis. Kainos in Greek means new. Ana is again or up. Anakinosis means to be once again new. An utter newness is what has been given to us by the Holy Spirit that has been poured out within us. And so he's reminding Titus, communicate this to the people, the baptized in Crete. And to this day, Crete still has a, a Christian population. So that we know that they have been faithful over the generations. But this utter newness that's given to us has been given to us also in this 20th and 21st century to be able to be the face of Christ to others during that redemptive time between that historical appearance of death and resurrection and that moment that we wait for in hope of the parousia so that we have this one moment of a gift to us, individually, to be the communication of grace through our actions and honor and in hope to others, because a new creation, a new existence, brings about a new behavior and a new manner of living. So read this epistle, meditate on it. It is profoundly beautiful. And I leave you with the last verse, which is verse 8, which would normally follow this, but for some reason we don't quote it. Because he sums it up to Titus. And you'll notice also he says, make sure you communicate this to the people in Crete. Teach them. Correct. Direct. Because apparently Titus was getting a little cold feet. They don't like it. 
and they like spit coffee at me after mass. I, this is not good. So in the letter, you'll notice right in the middle, he tells Titus, make sure you're correcting, make sure you're directing, and don't let anyone hold you in contempt. We don't know what age Titus was. We get something similar with Timothy, but we know Timothy was much younger. That verse eight that I leave you with, he says, because when we understand this utter newness, this new creation, this new action, and of hope, then they who believe in God, he says in verse eight, they who believe in God must be careful so that they can excel in every good deed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And we will now proceed to the blessing of the waters. Please stand.
and will protect and visit and strengthen us through your only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and through your living Holy Spirit, to you be glory and may your mercy be upon us forever. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial of the Father, through him for our sin and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was in time converted there, and he came there. For our sake he was crucified under conscious power. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has so many to the prophets. We believe in one and only Catholic and Apostolic Church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. <coughs> Amen. Accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place on their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saints Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel, 
Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of Sister Teresa and Joseph. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we, who have remained in your divine love, be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O servant of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin. You are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom, through the grace of your only Son, and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you with purity and holiness. May we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit 
be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. He is right and just. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our things. O Lord, those who sing your praises are confident. They cry out, with angelic voices and with sweet melodies proclaiming Father, for you have exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba Father. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only son. Kyrie eleison. Babiyamu hadaktum kharshon ilay mabed khaye In sabi lachmo bidao kari shato Ubarakhu kadesh Waksho yabil talimitao karo mara Sabakhu lam mehne kulkhu Ono deni tao Fahurudil Dahlof Aikun Wachlof Sagiyek Metakaseyo Metihab Khusuyot Khawme wa khayyay Dal qalam alami So dams ko men hamro wo men mayo bara ko kade ya bel talmi jao karo mara sab istao mehne kul ko o no deni tao demo dil diya ti ki khadato. Dahlo faikun, wahlof sagiyek, mete shedu meti hab. Khosoyon, haube wo hoye, dank alam alami. Do this in memory of me. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. In your and resurrection, we await your second coming. We enjoy your mercy and compassion. We ask. 
comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endure who can praise your plan of salvation for us we can only ask of you O lover of all people that this sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice may we be worthy of the forgiveness of all our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. As, O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. Profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, anin morio, ni te mordo rojo kayo kadisho, una rena la inu al corbono hono. This bread, the body of Christ our God, be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, and be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. In your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and the everlasting joys and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in the peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Israel Peter, our retired Patriarch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Holy Church. Teach them the word of truth, so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church 
and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith that they may live upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember the holy fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your glorious Son. Glorious St. Stephen the Archdeacon and First Martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, Grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your holy will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. sent your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with that prayer that he taught his holy disciples, the saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Kingdom of power and glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be made holy in us, that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty, and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts. And let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever with your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, Father, one holy Son, one holy, Son, one holy Spirit, bless us in the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God. God so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. Lord our God, to you glory.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us. Bless us and sanctify us by the cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So we have just two announcements. One is thank you. 
These are the vestments that when we had the 30th anniversary for the priesthood in July, we had a separate collection. These are the vestments that we had made from that. So thank you very much. I think they came out rather well. The second point is you'll notice in the bulletin on Saturday evening, the intention was for Mr. Charles Owen, Marnie Sam. And we have it at four o'clock because during, he died on April 28th. We have a plaque in the back on the wall of all of the donors in the back. When he passed away in April, he had been coming, well, not for the last few years because he was sickly, but for the Saturday evening. So for all the next year, pretty much every Saturday evening is going to be offered for the repose of his soul, that he may enter into the kingdom of light fully. Because at his death, he actually left us a substantial inheritance. And even years before that, he had made us, the parish, the beneficiary of his life insurance because he was an employee of the state of Maine. So that was the first gift. And then in his last days, literally his last days, like three days before he entered into the light, he made us the heirs. He has easily given St. Joseph, financially speaking, another three or four years because of his substantial generosity. Let it be example to all, but at the same time, he is certainly worthy then of our prayers because of his fidelity, of course, to us and the community. And what's even more beautiful is apparently many people didn't even know he was quiet, lived more or less like a hermit. And so... God bless him for even that greater generosity in his devotion to the apostolate of our Lord's gospel. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment, the blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the most holy trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.